Hello and welcome back. That was a lot of fun. But now it's time to introduce our talk for the evening. I'll start with our normal announcement. There'll be a Q&A after the talk. And if you want to submit a question or vote for your favorite, please go to sitp.online slash ask. And if you like what we're doing, then please help us out with a donation at sitp.online slash donate. We've also now announced all of our events up until the end of the year. And you can find out what's coming on up at sitp.online or on our Facebook page. Tonight's speaker is Pixie Turner, talking about how social media has shaped the way we eat. Pixie Turner is a registered nutritionalist, trainee psychotherapist, and science communicator. Alongside her degrees in biochemistry and nutrition, she, has, uh, she also has over 130,000 followers on her Pixie Nutrition social media accounts. Pixie has been featured as a nutrition expert on BBC, Sky, and Channel 5, and divides her time between clinics, uh, social media, teaching, hosting her podcast, public speaking, and looking after her growing collection of houseplants. Uh, she has written several books, with the most recent, The Insta Food Diet, looking at the way in which social media has shaped the way we eat. So please put your virtual hands together for Pixie Turner. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me here. I'm very excited about this. So, yeah, as said, my, my latest book focuses on this topic of how social media has shaped the way we eat, which is why this was the subject that I was told would be good for to talk about this evening. So let's uh, let's get into it. As, as said, um, just to reiterate, I am a registered nutritionist. This is a protected title in the UK. Nutritionist by itself, not so much, but registered nutritionist, absolutely a protected title. I have a master's degree in nutrition. And at the moment, I'm also a trainee psychotherapist because I'm particularly interested in the intersection between food and psychology. And that is also partly what has shaped us. Uh, what I'm going to be talking I work in private practice, so I have my own clinic where I work with people for a number of different uh, nutrition-related issues, including things like uh, emotional eating, um, overeating, difficulties, general um, concerns with people's relationships with food, body image, and all sorts of things like that. In particular, a lot of that happens on social media, which is why I'm so particularly interested in this topic. So let's get into it. Why social media? Why is this such a topic that I think is really important to talk about? It's where pretty much everyone is. So there are over 2 billion people now using Facebook, over 1.9 billion people using YouTube, and over a billion people on Instagram. That's a lot of people. I mean, in total, there were 3.48 billion social media users in 2019. That is a lot of people. In fact, that equates to around 45% of the current world population. It's clear that social media is absolutely where everyone is and where everything's happening. So no wonder we spend a lot of time on it. In fact, social media occupies two out of every five minutes we spend online. And considering a lot of us spend many hours on social media. That is, and with that many users, that is a lot of hours that's being spent on these platforms on a day-to-day basis. And actually, food is one of the most popular things that people post about online. Pizza is the number one food in the world that people post about on social media. Uh, curry also very much features in the top uh, in the top few in the UK in particular as well. But pizza, the number one most popular food that people post about. People tend to post uh, food that they are either proud that they have made or that they have eaten somewhere in particular that's very that's special to them, or it's just something that they feel offers them some kind of status or some kind of symbol says something about them when they post about it on the internet. So as it is something that is incredibly popular for people to post about because food is something that we use to tell other people about ourselves and we make a lot of assumptions about people based on what they eat as well. Actually, the most liked picture on Instagram is of an egg. This is quite a weird scenario. If you've not heard about this, this is it. This is the world record egg. And this is an account that someone created purely for the purpose of trying to be the most liked post on Instagram because they were pissed off that the world record was held by Kylie Jenner, who is one of those Kardashian type people who is not actually famous for anything in particular, just for being a person who looks pretty. That's my understanding, at least. And uh, that post had around 18 million likes. And this world record egg made it to, on this count, over 27 million likes. It is still, I check this, it is still the most popular 
picture, the most liked picture on Instagram. What a world we live in that an egg takes the number one spot. I mean, I'd still rather it be the egg than Kylie Jenner, but, you know, that's just me. All right. Food is a social thing. Humans spend a lot of time with other humans, maybe not so much now, but generally humans are very social creatures and food is a very social thing. Generally, when we spend time with other people, we do that with food. And so now, thanks to social media, eating is no longer just an activity that we do. It's an aesthetic. It's something that we look at and we communicate with without actually having to put anything into our mouths because it's always implied. This is the thing about social media in particular and about taking pictures of food is that we don't ever actually tend to see the eating process. Eating is always implied. So it's an aesthetic. There is an, there is an image-based focus to it that is not just based on taste and smell. It's about how it looks. And social media is one of the most significant social revolutions to happen in the world of food and health. Um, so in order to really understand why food is one of the most popular subjects online, we need to understand food as a social thing. Because our very first experience of eating is in fact a social one. It's a social one that is associated with comfort. It's a shared experience between parent and child. Hopefully, the, one of the first things that happens after we're born is that we are held by a caregiver and we are fed. And that is a social thing. That is an emotional thing. It is a beautifully comforting thing. And sharing food is now seen as a gesture of love. If you want to show someone that you are thinking about them, you maybe send them a box of chocolates, for example. Or if people, someone's going through a hard time, you might make some food, put it in a Tupperware and send it their way. It's a gesture that says, I care about you. I'm thinking about you. And I want to make sure you're okay. And so when we share food on social media, we are deliberately inviting other people to participate in our eating experience. So even though statistics show that we eat alone more than half of the time, by posting about our food on social media, we're actually never fully eating alone. We're always bringing other people into that eating experience. And even if we're not posting about our food, by looking at food and by sharing that experience of what other people are eating, we are in our way eating with other people even when we're not sitting at the same table necessarily, especially at the moment. At uh, the beginning of one of the first lockdowns, I, I got together with my family on Zoom and we all ate dinner together. And it was really lovely when we hadn't seen each other in a while. And, you know, we'd get together and drink wine. These, this, is, this is like the beautifully social thing about food. Let's take a look at the, the kind of the who, the what, the how and the why of all of this social media and food business. So when we look at who... We need to ask ourselves the question, who has the power to shape the way we eat? And it turns out that pretty much anyone we follow online potentially has that power over us. Not always, but potentially. Because social media has made our private lives public and we have more access to other people's lives than ever before. And this gives a lot more people potential power and potential influence over others, including us. And even if we don't see what people eat, because not everyone posts what they eat online, we still get to see what they look like. And through that, we can make assumptions and judgments about people eat based on their appearance. We do this a lot. For example, just very basically, we are much more likely to assume that someone who does yoga is also vegan and that a weightlifter eats a meat heavy, high protein diet, for example. Or we might make an assumption that someone who has a Sunday roast every week is a traditionalist who likes routine and control. We tend to make these kind of assumptions. You might have noticed there were some headlines not that long ago, maybe last year, that said that um, people who drink gin are psychopaths, which is a bit harsh, I think, and uh, was based on the idea that if you enjoy bitter flavors, then maybe you have slightly less of an emotional, empathic response to people, and maybe you're a bit more of a psychopath taking it a little bit to the extreme, as media headlines are, of course, want to do. But uh, there is something to it in the sense that we, we do make a lot of assumptions and judgments about people based on their food, based on their appearance. And we extrapolate a great deal from that. There's one really interesting study that, uh, that said that in the US, I think around like 40% of, of young people would potentially choose who to date based on what would they put in their shopping trolley. So, you know, that's potentially the next dating app. Put what's in your shopping trolley, see who matches and see if you can go on a date. So 
there are these ideas of social norms, and these are norms that influence our food choices. So social norms have been described as comprising among the least visible and yet the most powerful forms of social control over human behavior. And these norms, they can occur if we're sitting across a table from someone in a restaurant, for example, or if we're alone. But our food choices are constantly shaped by those around us. Um, that can be physically in the same room. It can be virtually through social media, for example, as well as through society, our self-perception, so our perception of ourselves, and also by various expectations of us. And this could be something like if you go to a restaurant and everyone orders a burger, you might, you know, cave into that, that norm, that peer pressure and order one too. And, you know, someone doesn't have to be sitting opposite you in order for them to influence your food choices in some way. Simply having some information about what other people's eating habits are is actually enough to influence what we eat and how much. And this is something known as informational social influence, because it turns out having information about how someone eats and what someone eats is just as powerful as seeing it. You don't need to see the food. Just having that information is, is just as powerful. There's one study that I really love that focuses on chocolate in particular. And so in this study, uh, the number of chocolates taken by visitors in the lunchroom at work was much higher when there were some empty chocolate wrappers in the bowl because this indicated that the norm was for people to take a chocolate. And this worked even though visitors didn't see anyone else eat a chocolate. They only saw that there were some empty wrappers and therefore made the assumption from that that, oh, other people have had one therefore it's okay for me to have one too. So the wrappers were evidence enough. And one of the easiest ways that we get information about what people eat is through social media. We don't actually see anyone eat a lot of the time on social media, but we do get to see the picture, the plate, them sitting in a restaurant. So all of that is, as I said, implied. And then we have social comparison. And this is where we compare ourselves to people who are similar to us, uh, but either slightly better or slightly worse than us. And this can happen in a number of contexts and num with a number of behaviors. For example, with intelligence, we do it with our grades at school, for example. Uh, with sports, we might compare ourselves to someone who's just slightly better so that we can work on improving ourselves. Finances and, of course, food and eating. So, for example, children will get, will very, very quickly complain that if a sibling got a larger portion than them. And that's not to say that their portion isn't sufficient, it's that comparison. And, you know, as adults, we're not necessarily that much different, even if sometimes it is an unconscious process. And also, what's interesting is that people who are on a diet tend to be even more influenced by, by that comparison with what other people are eating. Because dieters are more likely to be concerned around what they're eating, what other people are eating, and more likely to use that comparison as a guide. Whereas individuals who have food freedom, have a really good relationship with food and themselves and uh, appreciate uh, their bodies and who are confident in their bodies are actually less likely to be concerned around what other people are eating and what other people perceive about their way of eating or that they might be eating something that is deemed bad in some way. Side note, food is not good or bad. That's not how that works. So one of the most obvious example of social comparison is something like what I eat in a day videos, which are quite popular on YouTube, but also to a certain extent on Instagram now as well. And this is where some influencer usually posts a video of, of them basically sharing everything that they eat in the day. Most of the time you don't actually see them eat it, but they just say, so here guys, here's my breakfast. I've made this and I've made this. And then afterwards they show the empty bowl. Hey guys, it's mid morning and I'm going to get myself a snack from the fridge. And this is what I usually have for a snack. Kind of like that. And uh, they're very popular videos, those. Um, I don't like them. I don't think it's helpful for us to have that much comparison with somebody else. It reinforces this whole idea of if I eat like this person, maybe I'll look like this person, even though genetics is kind of the main thing that gets in the way of that. But uh, they are very, very popular videos. And of course, the more followers you have, the more influence you potentially have. As humans, when our brains see large numbers of likes and followers, we are more likely to join in, we're more likely to listen, and we're less likely to question something. Because if something's popular, we want to be in on it, on what's popular.
And there's actually a lot that happens in the brain when we see pictures of food. There are a number of different areas of the brain that tend that light up when we see pictures of food. And these are, oh God, I hope I say this right, the amygdala, the lateral orbitofrontal orbitofrontal cortex and the insular cortex. And these are all part of the appetitive brain network. So all of these parts of the brain that light up when we see pictures of food are all part of the appetite system in the brain. And so when the amygdala lights up, it sends some sensory cues to other parts of the brain, which is part of reward processing. And that produces that signal of, of salivation and that preparation to eat. You know, when you start thinking about your food and you go, mm, you can feel like that saliva starting to build in your mouth. And you start to really want food as well. And of course, in response to external cues, but also internal hunger that may come from the stomach, for example, that sends a signal to the insular cortex, which then produces a memory retrieval of previous food experiences. So when we put all of this together, what we see actually is that there is no real difference between seeing pictures of food and seeing actual food on a plate in front of you. Your brain very much sees those in a very similar way. And so, you know, when, when you're scrolling through social media, you're not necessarily just going to see one picture of food. You're going to see a whole feed's worth of pictures, depending on who you follow, of course. But you might be seeing loads of pictures of food on a regular basis. And that's potentially going to drive up that your appetite and drive up your desire to eat sometimes. Even if you're not actually hungry, it might just be like, oh, I really want that. That looks delicious. Even if you're not actually hungry. Of course, if you add hunger to that, oh boy, you're definitely going to want to eat soon. Okay. Moving on to the how, so how we eat and how that is shaped by social media. So we have um, distracted eating. I mean, many of us uh, spend a fair amount of time on our phones when we're with other people or, you know, we're watching things on screens or we're scrolling through social media while we're eating, especially if we're eating alone. A lot of us have a tendency to eat in front of the TV or to eat with our phones and just to scroll through, even to reply to messages and so on. And um, this is a bit distracting for us. And so generally what we encourage is, is mind, more mindful eating. And I'm aware this is a bit of a buzzword. It's got a lot of connotations attached to it now. But the idea behind mindful eating is, is a really solid one. And there's some really interesting evidence to also show that mindful eating allows us to more accurately recognize and respond to our body's signals of fullness. So it, we can tell more easily and more readily if we're feeling full rather than that distraction potentially disrupting some of that and not all of those signals quite making it to your brain and being recognized as easily because you're distracted by other things. It also can help us to enjoy our food more because we're focused on it. We're focused on the experience of eating. And um, actually, it can help us to digest food better because when we enjoy our food, when we eat more slowly, when we focus on our food, when we, when we, you know, we have that experience of eating more mindfully, we digest our food better because we've got the time to do that. We're taking our time. And actually, when you enjoy your food, you do actually digest your food better. So, you know, it's actually really good for you to enjoy what it is you're eating, which I think is great. <laughs> food tracking is another side of how social media is having an impact. So tracking food is a popular thing to do on social media. I know there are various apps and things like that that people use, but some people actually use Instagram in particular as a way of tracking their food by taking pictures of it rather than having to log every single thing that you're eating because it's much quicker, especially if you're if you're in a rush or you're out and you're in a restaurant. Just to take a quick snap is a lot easier than trying to calculate, well, how many grams of potatoes are in this dish and can I insert that into my fitness pal? Very time consuming. Also a bit obsessive. So the argument with tracking is that Information is power, and therefore it's empowering for us to have all, the, all of this information, which is why so many of us are now tracking things like sleep and um, stress even, possibly food, exercise, especially food and exercise. Those are kind of the main ones. Some people track their mood. Some people track their sleep, which, you know, if you want to do that, fair enough. Um, it's not necessarily always going to be a good thing. Uh, research shows that actually activity tracking, for example, can decrease the enjoyment of whatever form of movement it is that you're doing. And uh, it can sometimes actually lead people to move less when they don't have their tracker or to feel like, well, that was a wasted workout because I didn't track it, for example. 
There's actually one study in 2017 that found a link between the use of calorie counting and fitness tracking devices and eating disorder symptoms among college students, for example. Uh, there's also there was a survey in 2016 of female Fitbit users, fi female Fitbit users, and um, around 60 percent, almost 60 percent, felt that their days were controlled by their devices, and 30 percent called the device an enemy that made them feel guilty. Now that to me doesn't sound particularly healthy. Now obviously, hashtag not all people, but unlike specific tracking apps, social media can be really motivating for some people. It's definitely worth saying that. It can provide some sense of community. It can provide some accountability as well. But any kind of tracking also has the potential to be obsessive and harmful. And I think that is a risk uh, risk assessment that we all need to take with ourselves and is going to be very individual, depending on our history with food, for example, um, our understanding of food, our relationship with food and our bodies, and all of this is part of it. We have performative eating. This happens on social media and it it still amazes me that this is a thing. So there are definitely people, influencers, who go to a restaurant, order food, take some pictures of it, pay and walk away without eating anything, which to me is just the most depressing thing because why would you do that? It's just, it's, it's just, I don't understand. Food is wonderful. Why would you not want to eat something that you've ordered? It doesn't make any sense. But people share on Instagram what they want people to think and see about them. And that isn't necessarily an accurate reflection of what people do eat. Um, I tried to interview some people for this to try and understand, well, why do people do this? And unsurprisingly, no one really wanted to admit that they do this. Um, but there have been there has been the occasional anonymous influencer who has shared online that this is something that they have done. And I know it's a thing because restaurant owners have told me about it, that it is a real phenomenon. And it's very frustrating because there's, there's so much food waste and that drives me mad. There's enough food waste in the world as it is. We also have food challenges. So this is an example of that performative eating. We have things like the 10,000 calorie challenge, the cinnamon challenge, the soy sauce challenge, and so on and so forth. They're all a bit strange. Uh, they all are potentially harmful. Uh, some of these have put people in hospital. For example, the soy sauce challenge puts someone in hospital. Don't drink like a gallon of soy sauce. It's not a good idea. That's way too much salt for one person in a day. And let's be honest, these challenges tend to be for attention and validation from others. If they weren't filming it and taking photos of it, would they really do it? I don't think so. And some of these, like, you know, the 10,000 calorie challenge, if someone were to do that in private, you'd probably be more inclined to express concern than to be like, wow, amazing, what an amazing thing you've done, like, share, all of that stuff. But because there's a camera, it somehow makes it okay. Mm, I don't think so. Of course, then there's food extremism in that social media absolutely drives us towards more extreme behaviors, ideas, and perceptions. And this is something that I find incredibly fascinating. So I want to delve into that a little bit more. So there are a number of reasons why social media is a very popular platform for misinformation and for extremism. So social media is, is free. It's accessible. There's a very low barrier to entry. You can very quickly reach large groups of people and you don't have to put a huge amount of effort into it in order to make that happen. Anyone can just create an account at any time very easily with very minimal effort. And of course, when there are so many people, it's very hard to regulate what's going on. And the algorithms themselves actually promote maximum viewing. And this is where I specifically focus more on YouTube because this is where that kind of that viewing of videos um, tends to play a role. So extreme pseudoscience tends to get more views and therefore it's promoted and it's recommended to other users. So they too then spend more time viewing things. And so these this extreme and pseudoscientific content tends to be pushed more by algorithms than the scientific stuff. And so it inadvertently accidentally encourages these ideas and YouTube and other platforms, they very much benefit from this because the more videos we watch and the more time we spend watching them, the more ads we see, the more money the platforms make. Makes sense. So it's very much within their interest to get us to watch more, to spend more time. And the way they do that is by promoting the stuff that's going to get the strongest reaction and going to get you to stay. And that tends to be things that are quite extreme. And this is why you may find that 
videos about vegetarianism would lead to recommendations for fruitarians all of a sudden on YouTube. And uh, if you look for videos on jogging, you might then get recommendations about ultra marathons. It's like you can never be extreme enough for the algorithm. It's always just pushing it further and further. Of course, social media, fantastic echo chambers. And I don't say that as a compliment. We know from systematic large scale studies that people who hold extreme views on social media don't tend to interact with people outside of their group very much. They tend to spend a lot of time within their group. We choose to follow what we want to, and especially on Instagram. We tend to, uh, whereas on Twitter or on Facebook, we can see things that are shared or retweeted by others. On Instagram in particular, we don't see a lot of that. A little bit on stories, but not so much on people's main feed. We don't really see things unless we have chosen to follow someone. And so we can really easily create an echo chamber for ourselves. And we, we can very easily just not engage with anyone who thinks or eats differently from us if that's what we want to do. Of course, alongside that, there's a hell of a lot of confirmation bias because we look for information that already confirms our beliefs. And social media very much allows us to do that because it's so quick and accessible and easy to get to. This idea of the consistency principle. And this means that we don't like to appear inconsistent in our ideas or our behaviors. And that can be useful if you're trying to build a healthy habit, like, for example, remembering to floss every single day. That it can, it can improve adherence. That's actually a good thing. But the problem is that social media creates a permanent record of all of our activities. So it's very difficult to change your mind or to appear to change your mind, even if you're doing it for the right reasons in the face of getting new evidence or better evidence and you're changing your mind in response to that, which absolutely we need to be encouraging. So people instead end up feeling compelled to stay on the same track, to, to appear consistent, to avoid criticism from others for selling out or being fake or, or all of this. I mean, because of that permanent record, it absolutely encourages us to continue on the same path, even when it's no longer serving us. And, you know, that can then drive people more and more extreme. You don't get a huge amount of content online about people changing their minds. And if you do, they receive a hell of a lot of abuse. And, you know, extreme content, it stands out. If I were to show you 50 pictures of pasta you would probably going to remember the one that's either bright green or you're going to remember the one that is the biggest pile that's so huge you can't possibly imagine eating it because it's bigger than your face. Those extreme ones are the ones that are going to stand out. The most beautiful bowl of pasta that's, you know, a, a normal portion, whatever that means for you, that's been beautifully created, it's not going to stand out in the same way. So our brains are drawn towards things that are that stand out in that sense, and extreme stuff does tend to stand out in that way. So I spent a fair amount of time looking at these kinds of behaviors and looking at the extremism that exists on social media. I had to do a lot of it on incognito mode because the kind of adverts that I started getting, not good, really weird stuff, very weird stuff. And so based on everything that I've seen, I've created a little bit of a model that shows how this extremism has grown over time and how it's changed over time. So if we start with imagining this as a pendulum swing, we've got this pendulum and it started with Atkins, say. We started with Atkins, not particularly extreme, pretty, you know, not exactly terrible necessarily, slightly on the low carb side, but not hugely extreme necessarily, especially in the kind of modern iteration of it. We swing over the other to the other side, we get veganism, which once upon a time was considered extreme. Now it's just normal. Now it's just a thing. But that's more to kind of the plant side on the other it tends to be tends to be higher carb. And that's kind of what's differentiating here. And then we swing over to paleo, which was quite a big thing. Oh, what was it, like 10 years ago, paleo was quite a big thing. Uh, not so much anymore. Pete Evans apparently has been is now been dropped by his management and booksellers and all sorts of things for being a neo-Nazi or something like that. It's been in the news very recently. Slightly concerning. So paleo was more of a thing 10 years ago, again, towards the low-carb side. Let's swing over to the other side and to raw veganism, a more extreme version of veganism where you can't eat anything 
that has been cooked in any capacity, so no potatoes, no beans, no lentils, a lot of your protein sources going down the drain. Oh, no grains, so, you know, that's a problem, but, you know, a lot of fruit, so it's becoming very high carb anyway because of that. And over we swing to the other side, keto, a more extreme version of paleo, where, you know, there's there's no grains Again, no beans, no pulses. There are a lot of things that are off limits again here. So it's a more extreme version of, of paleo, more recent again as well. Over to the other side, fruitarian. A more extreme version of raw veganism where, you guessed it, all you can eat is fruit. Just fruit, nothing else. And most recently, we've had the carnivore diet, which is uh, has been perpetuated by a former orthopedic surgeon in California who lost his license, um, and also Jordan Peterson, who seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth. Uh, him and his daughter were huge proponents of the carnivore diet. In fact, his daughter, Michaela, um, sells a plan called the Lion Diet, where basically she just tells people to eat beef, salt, and vodka. I think it's vodka, might be bourbon, nothing else. And she will charge you several hundred dollars a year for the privilege of telling you that, yep, you just eat meat. Nope, just meat. Yep, you ate some meat. Good job. Keep going. Is that worth a few hundred dollars? I don't think so. So that's where we've been at more recently. There are people out there who are eating nothing but meat. That is pretty extreme. I think we can all agree that that is a very, very extreme way of eating. So, next. Great question. I think one of two things is going to happen. Either we're going to swing all the way to the other side and we're going to get something like the, the rice diet. Or, um, yeah, I mean, we already have like a starch diet. That's already a thing that existed a while back. But I think something like the rice diet is going to become a thing. Or otherwise, the freely the banana girl's banana diet is going to become a really big thing where she eats 30 bananas in a day. Again, very extreme why it's just way too extreme for my liking so that's one option the other one is that possibly the pendulum's hopefully going to drop nicely back down to the bottom and potentially the whole process is going to start all over again and interestingly what we see with this is there seems to be a strong political divide where on the left side with the the, the carnival side we tend to get more right-wing views and on the on the other on the other side with the the vegan side the fruitarian side we tend to get more left wing views. There's also it seems to be a gender divide where on the carnivore side we tend to get more men and on the vegan side we tend to get more women, which is interesting in itself. There are strong links between the carnivore community and men's right activists, for example, the Red Pill on uh, community on Reddit, for example. There's a strong overlap between those. Um, and there's also a very, very strong overlap, obviously, between ve the idea of veganism and uh, and compassion being one of the components of ethical veganism, for example, there. And uh, there are there are considerably more female vegans than male vegans, partly because of the way that we use food to perform gender and the idea that meat is inherently masculine and uh, vegetables are feminine in some way like that, which is a whole other conversation that's really interesting, um, which is why we don't tend to get as many vegan men as uh, women who are vegan. So I hope that it's gonna, the pendulum's going to drop nicely to the bottom, but who knows? Who knows? But this is definitely the pattern that I've seen over the past few years, decades even. All right. What are the health implications of all of this? So... Spending large amounts of time on social media is associated with things like depression and anxiety, for one. Compared to those who use only a few social media platforms, those who use 7 to 11, I didn't realize there were that many, but that many platforms, the odds of having uh, greater symptoms of both depression and anxiety are substantially higher. So it's the more time we spend on social media, the more likely we are potentially to develop things like depression, and anxiety, or to be more susceptible. And the more platforms we use, which again increases the odds of how much time we spend, may also be playing a role with that. And there's also research that shows that people who had uh, who used Facebook most frequently tended to have lower self-esteem. So the number of likes that people get on their Facebook profile pictures is is associated with self-esteem but only temporarily so if you get a lot of likes it temporarily increases your self-esteem but it drops again quite quickly and a lack of engagement can cause a drop in our self-esteem as well 
Now, absolutely, some people are more are more sensitive to this than others, which depends on a whole variety of factors. Um, but this does seem to be a pattern. We get lots of engagement. We feel good temporarily. We don't get engagement. We feel pretty crap. Again, that can be temporarily or it can last a while. And uh, research also shows that spending more time on social media is associated with body checking, um, unrealistic body ideals, high levels of body comparison, um, being more dissatisfied with your weight and more disordered eating and potentially risk for potential risk for eating disorders there as well. So interestingly, social media, your, your, the time you spend on social media can actually predict how dissatisfied you will be with your body and your eating 18 months down the line. The time you spend on social media now could potentially give you an indicator of whether you're going to feel pretty shit about yourself in 18 months. Now that to me is an indicator that maybe it's worth reducing that a little bit. And there's actually an interesting pattern that I've noticed when it comes to social media and disordered eating in particular. Um, a lot of people have reached out to me and said that platforms like Instagram have enabled their disordered eating habits in the past through the people that they were following. But once they unfollowed those and replaced them with people who uh, were actual professionals or people who had recovery accounts, for example, people who were very positive around food, that actually really helped them persevere with recovery and get to a happier place with food. Because social media really can have a powerful influence over things like that. Uh, in 2016, the eating disorder psychiatrist, Dr. Mark Borelowitz, said that a, around 80 to 90 percent of patients attending his clinic were avid followers of bloggers and social media influencers who advocated for cutting out large numbers of food groups and entire food groups, including things like sugar. And unfortunately, I can very much say the same about my clinical experience. It's quite scary. A lot of the people who come in who have disordered eating, who, have, who are really dissatisfied with themselves, have cut out food groups because of something that someone said on social media, for example. And so changing who they follow online, for example, can make a difference, just a little difference, quite quickly. So in addition to all of that, there's also evidence that social media is potentially disrupting sleep. Uh, there was a survey in 2017 that showed that 55% of people look at their phone within 15 minutes of waking up and 28% within five minutes of trying to sleep. That's a lot of potential blue light that is, of, that is potentially going to have an impact on sleep. In fact, some people even sleep with their phones under their pillows so they either can check it very quickly if they wake up. Not great for sleep. Sleep's kind of important for loads of different aspects of our health. There's also an argument to be made about how all our time that we're spending on social media is potentially causing us to be more sedentary because it's displacing other social activities that might be more active, for example. Because, you know, you don't generally tend to be very active. It's just your thumb that's active when you're sitting there and scrolling. All right. I spent a fair bit of time talking about the impact of social media on our individual kind of uh, relationship with food and our food choices. But I also want to look at this more broadly in terms of things like the food industry and also the restaurant industry and even how social media is affecting our laws and policies. So when it comes to the food industry, there is a lot of misinformation on social media, of course, and a lot of this is perpetuated through influencers. Um, because it's very easy for brands in particular to circumvent actually the, any kind of legal regulations on health claims through influencers. But the Advertising Standards Authority is starting to crack down on all of this now and misleading claims are starting to be investigated, which is great. Uh, so if you're looking for some fun in your spare time, in all the spare time that you have right now, go to the ASA website and... Um, There'll be some great examples of various rulings and things that people have said that are absolutely wrong, misleading, hilariously stupid sometimes. I mean, some of the examples of rulings that, that I found were like boosts metabolism, fat burning, twice as much vitamin C as an orange, detox, that big one, and uh, carb blocker, which is here the example I've given here, which was a complaint around a uh, protein world supplement that claimed to be a carb blocker and it was in relation to a post that a particular influencer who was I think she was on Geordie Shore or something like that I'm not sure I don't watch any of that but apparently I think she was on a show like that and um, 
she made a post about these car blockers and it had to be taken down. These posts by the company and by the influencer were taken down because of two complaints. Only two. So if you're feeling like you want to do some good in the world, report a whole bunch of things to the ASA because they will absolutely investigate. If there's one or two complaints, they will still investigate and potentially potentially some brands may have to completely change what they're doing to be more in line with guidelines and actually do what is legal because a couple of people got pissed off. That is power. And that's amazing, I think. They've actually created an influencer's guide to making clear that ads are ads, which is something at least. I think at least it's something that that's happening because I think the responsibility lies always. It's with the consumers. That's the people who are consuming social media, the brands, the influencers, and the platforms themselves. And I think that responsibility needs to be shared. And we all need to play our part in that in order to make sure that this misinformation doesn't necessarily spread and that brands aren't allowed just to uh, to share misleading or illegal health claims through social media. So one way that platforms are actually starting to take some responsibility with this is with a recent development on Instagram. So Instagram is now restricting posts that promote weight loss products to under 18 year olds. So what you can do is you can report a post if you believe it violates this policy. So things like laxative diet teas, these lollipops. Uh, if you're not sure, Kim Kardashian has promoted every single one of these, I think, which is very concerning. So Instagram will then review it. And if it does encourage weight loss products, the post is restricted. So for example, if now, if you look at uh, the Instagram pages of some of these like detox tea companies, it's all of the squares on the grid just grayed out because they're all restricted because you have to confirm that you're over 18 in order to actually view the post. So it's not a complete solution, but it is, it's something. It's no longer allowed in the same way. And hopefully what this will mean is that fewer celebrities will be posing with their appetite suppressant lollipops because they've been paid a huge amount of money to do this, even though, you know, even though they're claiming that these products are responsible for their, their, the way their bodies look, whenever the whole world knows that they've actually had surgery, for example. So that's at least something. And of course, in addition to this, there are a whole host of people on social media with large followings who are countering misinformation now, which is absolutely great news because we need more of that. When it comes to the restaurant industry, um, apparently 30% of millennials would avoid a restaurant with a weak Instagram presence. So apparently a lot of us are using social media in order to decide where to eat, but also what to order. I mean, it's quite normal now for people to go to a restaurant knowing already what they want to eat because they've had a look at the menu, for example. And social media is actually really having quite an impact on the restaurant industry. For example, um, this amazingly strange thing from a BBC article that uh, there is a, a popular London cafe chain called Grind who went so far as to change their tables to marble in 2016 specifically because it looks good on Instagram. That was their intention. They replaced every table because it looks good on Instagram. And according to them, it actually paid off. They're actually getting more customers and people are spending more time there and taking more pictures and then getting more business because they've made it Instagrammable. They also tailor their menu according to what's popular on Instagram. So if something doesn't feature on Instagram a lot, they may replace it with something else, for example because a lot of people are now encountering their food for the first time through social media before they read it on a menu. So the appearance apparently really does matter. It's amazing. I've been there actually. They're nice marble tables, but to do that just for Instagram is I think really, really shows how much potential power it has. And of course, some people don't like the fact that people are asking for free food. Fair enough. There is a company called CVT Soft Serve, which is a popular food truck in LA, who they and they started to receive weekly requests from Instagrammers to who promised to post a photo of their ice cream in exchange for not having to pay. Now the owner got really fed up with this and decided enough is enough. And he made his feelings very publicly known. He went viral after posting a sign on the truck that read, influencers pay double. 
He shared on Instagram that he would never give people a free ice cream in exchange for a post. And he tagged the image with a hashtag, influencers are gross. And it spread around the globe. Apparently, he has a lot more business now because of that. Because a lot of people seem to think that he did the right thing. And they feel like, yes, because people are fed up with influencers demanding things. And there are even some chefs and restaurant owners who've said they feel blackmailed by influencers because sometimes people threaten to write bad reviews or to make public comments about um, public negative comments about their experience to all their followers unless they receive what it is they want. Now, of course, again, hashtag not all influencers. But it's amazing uh, people's sense of entitlement sometimes when they feel they are owed something for free simply because of the amount of followers they have online. And it also goes the other way. There are a lot of restaurants who will reach out to influencers asking them to come in and saying, you know, we'll give you we'll 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 give you free food if you post about our restaurant. I I mean I don't get those requests now, but I used to get a lot of those requests. Like a lot of restaurants offering me free food in exchange for me posting. I don't do it. I can't be bothered. I want to sit and enjoy my food. But some people they think it's great perks of the job which is fair. Now, when it comes to food policy, I'm aware this may not sound like the most interesting of topics, but I, I hope that I can make it sound as interesting as possible. So actually, social media has played quite a considerable role in shaping the conversation around public health and nutrition policy. So it's a way to engage the public and to create an, an appetite for change. So for example, in 2015, um, Love him or hate him, Jamie Oliver released a documentary uh, called Sugar Rush in which he looked at the effects that sugar was having on people's health. And he was so outraged by what he found out that he created a petition to introduce a tax on sugary drinks in the UK to improve our children's health. Now, that petition spread on social media very quickly. And within 48 hours, it had enough signatures to exceed the 100,000 mark needed for the issue to be considered for parliamentary debate. And so it was. And guess what? We have a sugar tax now. So there's no denying that that and the the spreading of this on social media had a significant impact on the tax actually becoming a thing. Um, data showed that the tax was backed by 69% of the public. And there was a lot of information on social media that was gathered, which showed the government that this was apparently something that the people wanted and therefore would be in their best interests to, to enact if they wanted to remain in power. Now, I'm not here to say this is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm very much going to leave that up to you. This is simply an example of where social media and one person's influence really made a difference in terms of what policy was passed and what happened, which is really quite something. And it's not just that. I mean, there are in examples of individuals on social media who don't have the same following that Jamie Oliver has, for example, but who have managed to change the law in a short space of time through a targeted social media campaign that has been quite incredible sometimes. So social media can actually contribute to changing policy through a combination of three specific tactics. It's putting on the pressure. So from talking to various public health and policy experts, because I am not an expert in these things, but I know people who are, they've said that in order to get traction in parliament, you need media traction. Okay. And social media, absolutely part of that. It helps to put the pressure on in that sense. We have accessible politicians. Uh, you can directly tweet your MP and people have full conversations and sometimes arguments with politicians on social media and voice their concerns directly. Politicians are more accessible than ever before. They even sometimes have blogs where you can find out exactly what they're thinking and you can critique it in a lot of detail which I did in the book with Tom Watson, for example. I have pulled apart several of his blog posts and mentioned everywhere where he is wrong. And that was quite fun. But I can do that because he's laid it all out for me to see. And I can go, nope, 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 very easily. That was fun. That was a fun afternoon. And also lots of data. Through social media, you can collect so much data. I mean, you can talk to politicians, but in the end, they want to be reelected. They want to know that publicly supporting something is in their best interests because the people want it, because it's something that will get voters on their side in that sense. And for that, you need proof, you need numbers and data. Online petitions spread very quickly through social media as well. Uh, you, people sign them very quickly, they share it, off it goes, and it can spread like wildfire. And hashtags, for example, can collect a lot of information all under one umbrella. You might have 
thousands of people all talking about similar things, but if they all use the same hashtag, you can now collect data on that that takes all those individual conversations, all those tweets, and turns them into a tangible number that can be used to prove that people are interested in a particular subject. So there's no doubt in my mind that social media can be an incredible way to reach to reach policymakers and to hopefully inspire you to get on board with a cause that you believe in and to potentially use social media in a way that actually means your voice will be heard more easily and more likely than potentially other ways that you might have to do that. It's so much more accessible now than it ever has been to potentially make your voice heard and to make a change in that way. So what do we do with all this information? All this is good and fun, but what do we do with it? Here are some of my suggestions of things that I feel are potential useful things to take away and things that also I've done to put all of this into context and to make some changes in relation to social media. Getting out of the echo chamber. I think it's so important to follow people who eat, think and post in a completely different way than we do. It's good for our brains to get out of that, to get a different perspective sometimes. Limiting your time online so helpful. On most phones, you can now set time limits on certain apps and on screen time in general. It's amazing how it can increase your awareness of how much time you're spending online. And also removing some notifications. They don't even come up in the first place. Big difference. Consider eating without your phone. Maybe put it in a different room, put it in your bag, in your pocket, so you're not tempted to look at it while you eat to allow yourself to enjoy that eating experience. Again, deliberately choose to read sources that don't fit your worldview. Get out of that, that echo chamber. Choose your experts wisely. Very wisely. Stop comparison. If someone makes you feel bad about yourself or your body, get rid of them. Replace them with something like puppies because you can't feel bad at your body if you're looking at puppies. That's, I mean, that's just basic science. Puppies are great. Use the block and restrict buttons liberally. Before you do so, ask yourself, am I just getting defensive or is this person actually just being an arsehole? Am I, if I'm getting defensive, why is that? Maybe this person's actually making a good point. Is it worth listening? If they're just being an arsehole, block, restrict. I like the restrict button because it means people can yell as much as they like and I'm never going to see it, but they think I do. And that gives me some great satisfaction. Maybe avoid social media in bed late at night. It disrupts sleep. Keeps your mind active about things that aren't important at that moment in time, because at that moment in time, sleep is your priority, the most important thing. So finally, I asked a whole bunch of people when I was researching for this book, why do you stay on social media? Why bother? If there's so many potential negatives about it, why stay on in the first place? Because there are some really great things about social media. It allows us to have those connections with other people, in particular when we're not able to meet people face to face. It allows us to meet people who have the same experiences as us sometimes when we need that because we don't have that in our day to day lives. And it just allows us to meet a whole bunch of people who we'd never otherwise come into contact with. And that's pretty amazing, I think. Share information and expertise, which is great. We can, if you have some knowledge, you can share it through social media so much more easily than you would in any other way. You can get inspiration from social media. You can learn a lot as well, which is kind of awesome. And it's free. It's all free stuff. We love free stuff. Creative expression. If you're artistic in some way, you can share all of that through social media. It gives you a platform to do that without having to own an art gallery, for example. It's more accessible. The aim, of course, is to get the benefits without too many of the downsides of social media. And I think that's possible through especially the things I've mentioned on, on kind of the past two slides there. I think, I think that's definitely possible. And I've done a lot of this myself and it's worked out pretty well. I have a much better relationship with social media now than I did a year ago. Oh, and that's that. Thank you for listening to me for this whole time. Thank you so much, Pixie. That was absolutely fantastic. Obviously, after the break, we're going to have a Q&A with Pixie. So if you've got any questions, head over to uh, sitp.online slash ask and get your questions in there. And also vote for your favourites so that we can put them to Pixie after the break. And now we're going to take a sort of 10, just over 10 minute break. We're back at 22.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the talk. I hope you've all had a nice chance to uh, refresh your glasses. Uh, we're now going to start with the Q&A with Pixie. So um, we're going to go straight into it by asking the first absolutely fantastic and as stated <laughs> in the question, important question. Pixie, where did you get your mason jug, jar mug? So this is something that is you can get in supermarkets. You can also get it on, you know, very popular unnamed giant websites that are named after rainforests. They're not expensive. They're quite useful as well. I like them. Thank you for noticing. And as a follow up question, what are you drinking? So I'm not a fan of the taste of just plain water. So I am drinking no added sugar lemon squash. Very nice. Very nice. OK, the next question comes from me. Um, what are your thoughts on insects as food? I think it makes a lot of sense in terms of the future of the planet and it makes sense for human health. There's, you know, there are a nutritious protein source. It makes a lot of sense in that regard. A lot of cultures already eat insects. And so I think it's a, it's a potential exciting avenue for the future. I think people, a lot of people aren't quite ready for it now. I've tried some. They taste fine. They don't have huge amounts of flavor. The ones I've tried, I tried like crickets and grasshoppers and things like that. Crunchy, generally. They're quite nice, but I think as a protein source for the future, great idea. I think the flavoring also comes down to how you do it, how you cook it. What's yeah, it's kind, of like, it's kind of like seitan. You know, seitan yeah. is a vegan alternative to meat, which is basically just pure gluten, which is why I love it, because it would piss off so many wellness wankers that it's just eating pure gluten and it's it's really doesn't taste like much but if you put some really great flavorings on it it's good some sweet chili sauce on a cricket perfect yeah uh, absolutely um the next question uh, comes from anonymous and it appears tonight anonymous has been very busy so there are quite a few from him um do you have a good example of someone to follow on social media someone who gets it right so pixie what's your website <laughs> <laughs> You can find me at Pixie Nutrition on social media if you want. I think I get it right most of the time. Uh, a couple of people also, Alan Flanagan, uh, Dr. Joshua Woolrich, um, Maxine Alley, uh, the food science babe, really good for a lot of stuff she is. Um, those are the names that immediately spring to mind. There are a lot. If you, if in doubt, look at who I follow on Instagram because they're probably going to be decent. Because the people, uh, the place where I follow people I disagree with is Twitter, not Instagram. But in, Instagram sort of your safe space now. Yeah, it's mainly plants and puppies and kittens and nature. And I know we've got um, one of our organisers and one of the most side skeptics is uh, doing a bit of work on Instagram and looking at woo on there, and she's had to create a new account. Because she couldn't cope with having the woo infect her normal safe space. Mm, yeah, it's tricky sometimes. For sure. Um, so following on from hearing about you say about the food science babe, uh, we have a question about the other food babe, uh, Vani Hari. What's your opinion of people like her? If she never said a single word again, the world would be a much better place to live. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Um, so, um, an, uh, Anonymous asks, overall, what do you think the most damaging nutritional myth prevalent at the moment? Mm. At the moment, specifically, I think it's the idea that certain foods can boost your immune system to the point where you are immune to everything that therefore you don't need to follow government guidelines on things like wearing a mask and social distancing and all of that kind of stuff that i see is dangerous and there are a lot of various peddlers of misinformation dietary misinformation have jumped on the covid denialism bandwagon and are sharing a lot of misinformation in relation to that which is hugely problematic a lot of the very prominent names in the low carb community, for example, the very like uh, zealous, obsessive, intense, extreme types in there who have a lot of followers. Yeah, a lot of people sharing some really concerning things like if you do CrossFit, you won't get COVID. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Are any of them saying specifically that specific diets can cure COVID or can prevent you from getting COVID or anything like that? 
Oh yeah, I've I've seen people say that veganism prevents it or cures it. I've seen people say that carnivore prevent prevents it or cures it. Keto prevents it or cures it. Low carb in general prevents it or cures it. There is a certain cardiologist in the UK who shall remain nameless because I last time I mentioned his name, he sent his entire army of Twitter followers to attack me. He's a bit of a in my humble opinion, he's a bit of a dick. Uh, it's my opinion. I'm allowed to say that. And um, he has written a small pamphlet of a book that basically says how you can essentially prevent yourself from getting COVID using food, which is, n no, that's that's not a thing. You science, like vaccines and, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the stuff that's actually proven to work rather than general ramblings of... Um unnamed cardiologists yeah. um anonymous anonymous asks um how long do people last on these extreme diets e.g the raw vegan or carnivore is the one more popular and durable than the others so we don't have huge amounts of data on how long people last on carnivore because it does seem to be quite a recent thing i think um i don't think there are many people who have been doing it who claim to be doing it for longer than five years there are some people who claim to be raw vegan for 10 years or so, but it's amazing how many of those after around the five year mark will post a video on YouTube saying, I got caught out eating this and I'm sorry. Like this happened a lot last year, January of last year, there were a huge number of um, quite uh, extreme vegan YouTubers who got caught eating things like fish and who then had to make very intense apology videos and um, got a huge amount of abuse. So, you know, we can see the content that they make, but like I said, there's no guarantee that people are actually following what they're eating. They absolutely could be lying. So a lot of these Instagram influencers, do you think they're lying to themselves, they're lying to their audience or both? Potentially both, because it's the consistency principle. We want to appear consistent and changing your mind about what you eat, especially when your whole online identity is based around what you eat. That's going to be tricky. I mean, what does a vegan YouTuber do when they're no longer vegan? They're not just a YouTuber who's vegan. They are a vegan YouTuber. What do you do? And this was a topic that came up last week around UFO conspiracy theorists who post videos. And if they, even if they know what they're posting is false, they're making money from what they're posting. And if they stop posting, they stop making money. And I imagine that's very similar with the Instagram um, and social media food scene. Yeah, absolutely. You change your mind. You're not consistent. People don't follow you. You don't get brand deals. And I mean, you did this, didn't you? You were um, you were food woo. Um, what, I was what a was wellness, it? wellness wanker. wanker. Yeah, um, wellness wanker. And you changed streams and you did lose some followers, I believe. But you maintained a large number. Mm. allowing you to do some of the work you do these days yeah yeah i did that was uh not a fun time in my life it was very stressful and i got a lot of abuse from people uh, on the internet not so fun that lasted a good two years oh yeah it's it's horrible you know people can be really mean especially when you undermine their own ideology or their own um belief system that yeah. And also people, if you're posting your food or you're posting things about yourself on social media, people feel a sense of ownership over your identity. And so if you change parts of your identity publicly, people get very angry and upset about that very quickly because they feel they've been deceived or they feel that uh, they, their, their interpretation of you is inaccurate. And because they feel that sense of ownership that you owe them something, they get very angry. I also think it's kind of that people feel like they know you. Because they yes. see into your life. No, actually, they see what you want them to see of your life. But yeah. when they see something that doesn't match with what their beliefs are around what you've been posting, that means they feel like they don't know you as well as they did and might hurt them in a way. Mm -hmm. And people get very defensive very quickly. And then that manifests as anger rather than trying to understand, why do I feel this way? People lash out. Um, des Disseminator very clever name uh, are there any diets in the past that would have been ex considered extreme but actually had value and became part of normal eating in a modern day in the modern day so both low carb and veganism were once considered to be quite extreme but now veganism is very much definitely mainstream uh you know it's not necessarily the best way of eating or the only way of eating but it has its merits and in for certain things like uh 
if you're struggling with uh, type 2 diabetes, for example, low carb approach is just one of many ways that you can manage that. And it's becoming a lot more of a thing now than it used to be. And so for those people who find that helpful, the fact that that's more mainstream is definitely definitely a good thing for them because they're, they're so much more in terms of understanding and products that you can buy in relation to that. So I would say both of those are pretty much normalized now. And also, I mean, it, when it becomes normalized, the research increases in it, which means that there is more actual information, which it might turn out that one of these fad diets is great. But until the science shows it, let's just keep researching rather than just making assumptions based on what uh, some un, uh, some person on Facebook says or person on Instagram. Yeah. Um, David asks, are there any good documentaries um, unwell was touted as um, sorry, uh, uh, touted, uh, touted as a counter to Goop Lab, but fell far short of the mark. Mm. So I know you do a, a podcast that do, works on this. Um, go on, you might as well uh, advertise it now. Well, it's a podcast that's called In Bad Taste, and it's uh, myself and my friend Dr. Nikki Stamp, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon, and we talk about these various documentaries. We analyze them in a lot of detail. We make fun of them where appropriate and we have a good time with it and we get angry. I especially get very angry very quickly and it's it's good fun. We haven't yet found a, a good health documentary, to be honest. Um, we, we only started the podcast this year, so you know there's a lot to still to still explore. But Unwell was one we did recently and it looked so promising based on the trailer and actually then it turned out to be a really big disappointment. There was just, you know, there were a few great experts in it like... Dr. Stephen Novella, I mean, what a legend, and then just wasn't given enough airtime, which was really, really frustrating. I think the only good one that I've heard of, which I, which you cannot unfortunately get on Netflix in the UK, is A User's Guide to Cheating Death, which is Timothy, uh, Tim Caulfield. Yeah. But unfortunately, you can't get that in the UK. But if at some point you can, that's definitely one to watch. So I've heard. I haven't seen it because you can't get it in the UK. Unfortunate. Um, oh, wow. Uh, ER50D uh, asks, how is how is best to approach people you know who eat extreme diets and are trying to convert others? Hmm. A couple of things, I think. Firstly, if they're trying to convert you, set some boundaries with that and kindly say, you know, I know that you're very passionate about this and you're trying to you're trying to help, but this is not helpful for me. So can you, would you mind just please stopping doing that? Because I don't want to hear about this. I don't want to be converted. I'm okay here. And be quite, you know, kind and give someone the benefit of the doubt, but be firm with that. Be like, I know you're trying to help, but don't, <laughs> don't do that. So I think that's, that's one thing. And secondly, you know, to a certain extent, arguing with someone like that is not going to get you very far. If they're not ready to hear what you have to say, it's only going to cause animosity between you and potentially damage a relationship that you have there. So just be, as someone who has been in that position of spreading misinformation, there comes a time when you are ready to hear what someone else has to say. And until that point, to a certain extent, there is something to be said about just leaving people to it as long as they're not causing too much harm. Because if they're not ready, they're just going to get more entrenched in that. They're going to be more likely to double down, which is not going to be necessarily helpful either. I find an approach that is less confrontational is more, I read this really interesting thing here, send link. What do you think about this? There's no judgment there. There's no, you're doing this and it's wrong. It's just like, isn't this interesting? What do you think? It's starting a dialogue and it's less confrontational, I think. I think it's really interesting. We get this question almost every week uh, from a different perspective around what are your thoughts on how to approach somebody who believes in naturopathy? How how do you feel? And it depends what the talk's on. Obviously, this week's about uh, food woo and uh, uh, some extreme diets, which has led to this one. Um, but I think all of our answers have had one thing in um, common, which is the um, compassion. Just show that you're there for them that you're not judging them, but that you want to help them and that you're there for them, not that uh, you're trying to change them. You're there for them. Yeah, because if, if you're non-judgmental, it also means that when they do change their mind, they're going to feel comfortable talking to you about it. And that's only going to be helpful for everyone. Absolutely. And I think this is a great time to introduce the skeptic uh, strap line, which is um, reason with compassion. And I think it is all about that. It is about 
being re- showing reason but being compassionate with it understand the person you're talking to yeah i 100 percent agree um trevor asks um have instagram co- commented on food influencers not not necessarily they've uh, they've done some work behind the scenes in terms of the uh, the ban that i mentioned uh, or the restricting of posts to under 18s that was something that instagram has done in collaboration with uh, various activists and uh, um jamila jamil was actually part of that she's a, she's an actress she was part of that conversation with instagram so they have kind of in that sense they occasionally make statements and get involved with particular things but in terms of influencers broadly Nothing beyond follow the ASA guidelines, which, you know, most people aren't necessarily aware of. And influencers, definitely not. They are once they get challenged by them. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, but that doesn't happen often enough yet. Unfortunately, I think Instagram and again, um, Alice has spoken about this before, about how it's one of those areas that people don't really look at in terms of uh, skepticism, in terms of looking at what's going on there. It's not like Facebook where everybody's on Facebook. I very, very rarely go onto Instagram. I don't look at it and therefore it's not in the forefront of my, uh, you know, in what I'm looking at. But when you look at the numbers of people on there, especially younger people, Mm. Um, the numbers are enormous and it can have a massive influence on people yeah absolutely people you know total peddlers of pseudoscience or you know occasionally quacks will uh, have millions of followers on instagram and i i'm trying to remember who it was that uh, that were listed the number of followers they had on instagram versus twitter and almost everybody had more followers on instagram than they did on twitter um yeah. and it, it's staggering that I'm, I'm one some, of those for somebody like me who doesn't really go on there i don't really use twitter either but um to think that twitter is such a big name you hear about twitter all the time you don't hear it you don't read in the paper about this happened on instagram yeah um gray the earthling asks um are people more likely to be influenced on social media by people they know anyway or by strangers slash celebrities People are more likely to be influenced by someone who they feel they have something in common with. In other words, they're a more ideal comparison target. So me as a 28-year-old woman, I'm less likely to engage in comparison with a 50-year-old man, for example. But if there are other influencers who, or I say other influencers, I'm not an influencer anymore. Why did I say that? If there are influencers who are similar to me in some way, they either look similar to me or they uh, they are you know similar age or come from the same place, whatever that is, that means I'm more likely to engage in that comparison with them and I'm more likely to potentially follow them as well because I see that we have something in common. So yes, friends and family to an extent, but also people we feel we have something in common with some kind of connection with whatever that is, whether it's a shared experience or a shared likeness those people tend to have more power over us. I'd also suggest possibly the people they look up to as well, the people yeah. who they want to be, not necessarily the person they are, the person they want to be. Absolutely, yeah. If you're following people who are like, they look amazing and exactly how I want to look. Yeah, potentially mm-hmm. you're going to look at their diet and see what they're doing that's so right to make them look so amazing. <laughs> yeah, but again, I'm more likely to do that with someone who is also a woman in her 20s rather than, a man in his 50s so. oh yeah absolutely yeah um anonymous asks a question I'm, i'll be honest i don't know a lot about this so uh bear with me anonymous asks um what's behind the asmr and monk bang food videos is this a pervasion and food wasting or a natural human tendencies to what uh, to enjoy watching such things so first of all what is this because i know nothing about it which means i suggest some of several of our listeners won't either yeah so ASMR, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's like when people start crunching things very close to the microphone. Or people have lovely soft voices that people like listening to. But it's like crunchy sounds or people chewing with very, very powerful microphones. Those kind of sounds, some people find that relaxing. Uh, Mukbang is a concept, particularly on YouTube, where people, usually young, thin, conventionally attractive people, will eat large amounts of food on camera whilst uh, whilst answering questions from people and this happens on youtube but this also happens on specific platforms it's something that's uh, that's originated in asia in in, in korea i think it was in south korea in particular and has kind of made its way over uh, there are specific platforms where people can uh, donate money 
or donate or offer um, money in exchange for someone asking their question, answering their question, sorry, or like if you pay a certain amount of money, you can then suggest what that person's going to eat next. And it's it's a really interesting idea because obviously the most the most popular people who do this are young women and they have a lot of men who watch this. And there is some idea that it's some kind of sexual perversion or something, but that doesn't seem to actually really be the thing. It's more that there's a, especially in South Korea, there's a strong amount of, there's a large amount of loneliness among young people who are quite isolated and more lonely than, uh, than perhaps previous generations. And so there's that idea of connection because food is a social thing and connects us with people. So there's something about that. There's also something about us liking watching people eat an unnatural amount of food that we feel is not really shouldn't be possible for someone who is so so small there's something about the idea of watching someone who is quite thin eating a large amount of food and then them coming back the next day and still being thin it's like wow how are they defying the laws of physics like that's you know there's something about that as well and also some people have actually stated that they find watching these videos helps them in their recovery from an eating disorder because it helps them to eat when someone else is eating and they don't and it's not a mutual experience where people are watching each other eat but it's it's one way and so they feel more comfortable eating in that scenario so there's a number of things potentially going on but it's uh, I've seen some of those videos they they it's quite amazing how much people can eat I know when I uh, when you mentioned the 10,000 calorie uh, challenge in the talk, I, I thought I'm going to Google this and just see what 10,000 calories looks like. First of all, your thing about young, attractive women posing with 10,000 calories, spot on exactly what I found when I Googled it. The top images were all attractive women, generally with a six pack, you know, like proper toned women standing there in front of this enormous amount of food. Yeah, Second- because it's socially acceptable. Because the idea is that based on their appearance, there's the assumption that the rest of the time you're being good and disciplined. So when you do this, it's okay because we know it's a one-off. And the second part of it, looking at that amount of food, what on earth? How, I mean, I've done one of these food challenges that you talked about earlier. Now, mine was a burger challenge. It was an enormous burger. It was probably 2,000, 2,500 calories, something like that. It was not like, but looking at 10,000, it's like, oh my God, how can you eat that? It's ridiculous. Ah, I just don't get it. I don't get how you can do that. A lot of food. It is a huge amount of food. As I said, my my burger, I I forced the last of it down because I was completely full by the end of it. But I still, I had to compete it. I had to complete that challenge. Um, and I got my certificate and I got my name on the wall of flame, as they called it. Are you proud um, of yourself? I am very proud of myself. Excellent. I believe I have my certificate somewhere. It is not unfortunately framed. <laughs> I couldn't find anybody to frame it. Um, Anonymous asks, um, do you think the diets of these Insta stars are within reach of most people? Loads of fresh fruits and loads of lean meat, for example. Depends, obviously, on what someone, what these influencers are eating. Uh, There is often a certain amount of privilege that comes with the way people are eating, that you have to have a certain amount of money to be able to afford this way of eating because... The popular influencers tend to have money because that's aspirational. So there's an aspect to that that is perhaps out of reach for a lot of people simply because of the cost nature of um, the way of, of a certain way of eating. The more extreme it is, it can be more expensive. I mean, it's also just unnecessary. <laughs> and I just wouldn't recommend it. I just wouldn't recommend eating nothing but meat or nothing but bananas. It flies in the face of absolutely everything we know about food, which is eat a lot of different things. A varied, balanced diet. And I mean, my, my grandmother uh, used to talk about how she used lard when she made her roast potatoes. But she did it once a week. It wasn't as if she was cooking with lard every night of the week. And it oh, was... my mum says goose fat. Goose fat. Yeah, I don't think goose fat was very available back when my nan was doing it. Um, um, <laughs> my nan, yeah, it, she, well, uh, she'd be a hundred and something now if she was still with us. So, you know, she's a much, much further back generation. But yeah, she uses, um, she used uh, duck fat. She used to have a glass of sherry before dinner. And all of these things were, it was a little bit of, you know, a bit of variety, but not to extremes, not cooking with goose, uh, goose fat every day or with lard or, it's a variety of using that, but also fresh vegetables and all the other things that come with it. Um, 
Trevor asked, who's the most powerful food influencer? I mean, I think celebrity chefs are probably p- pretty up there. But in terms of if I had to name one, honestly, I don't think there is one who is the most powerful. Maybe, maybe Jamie Oliver in terms of impacting policy, in terms of literally impacting all of us, even if we don't like it. Because, I mean, buying books or watching stuff, that's, you know, that's a choice. But if it impacts policy, then that impacts all of us. So maybe. But uh, there are so many to choose from. So many influencers who have millions and millions of followers. Absolutely. Um, Nadia asks, um, what's your take on body positivity? Are weight loss diets necessary in some cases? Is the set point hypothesis legit? Uh, Body positivity is not the same as positive body image. I think that's important to point out. Uh, Body positivity is a political social movement in order that says that all bodies deserve to be treated with respect no matter how they look and it centers the most marginalized bodies which tend to be those who society deems as not being good or not favorable so there's definitely something in that in the way that we are told by society that there is only one way of looking that is acceptable and good enough and that is in my view problematic um in terms of the rest of that so I, my stance on on weight loss is that intentional weight loss always carries risks, always. And those risks are usually not communicated well enough and not discussed enough. And that for a lot of people, actually, it's not necessary or helpful to focus on that. If people want to do that, it's your body, your choice, you know, if you want to do that. But I think the narrative that it is the only way to do things or the best way to do things is absolutely not the case for a lot of people. And uh, there was a final part to that. Um, Is the set point hypothesis legit? It's a hypothesis. Um, They're like a lot of things about the human body. We don't fully understand it. It has a lot of merit to it. The idea that our bodies kind of have a natural settling point at which if we eat when we're hungry, stop when we're full, eat a variety of things, move a little bit, that our bodies kind of naturally kind of sit there. It is largely determined by genetics, of course. Um, Our environment, our food environment doesn't necessarily make that the easiest thing to do. But uh, it definitely has has merit, whether it is an absolute truth. It's not an area of science that particularly works that way. So I think we're going to wrap it up with one final last question which is Andrew from Peterborough asks, would the world be a better place if there were no influencers? Probably. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Especially the ones who eat, who, who order food and don't eat it. And the ones who spread misinformation. Let's be honest, when it comes to influencers, there are more people spreading misinformation than information. And arguably, healthcare professionals on social media are doing science communication and are not influencers. And therefore, by that strict definition, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, the people doing the real science, yeah, they're not influencers. They are communicating the facts of what's going on um, and showing us what we should be doing. Um so um, with that, I would like to say thank you so much to Pixie for joining us. Absolutely fantastic talk. Brilliant Q&A. Um, re- really glad to have had you on here. Um, and I'm padding because, again, just like last week and the time before, I haven't got up next week's talk. So bear with me a moment. Um, there we go. So next week we have uh, Planetary Protection, Guardians of the Galaxy or Lame Science Party Poopers. <laughs> with do- uh, And again... I do this every time. I never have enough information up here. Bear with me. Um, With uh, Dr. Jennifer Wadsworth. Um, It's also in conjunction with the annual European Researchers Night special event. So um, please come and join us next week. Um, And thank you very much for joining us.